Welcome to Boing Boing TV. I'm Shani Jardin, and I'm here with Kevin Kelly in his home, in his office. And we, we're we looking at a book, uh, Asia Grace. The, the photographs in this book, you took these over a, a course of many, many years. They're all based on my independent travel in Asia between 1971 and the late 90s. And I took these pictures with probably five different kinds of cameras, including little point and shoots. One of the things that it kind of shows is that you can use any kind of a camera. Um, it's like having a good meal and saying, you must use really good pots. Well, no, it's all about the eye. What started this, um, the, the series of travels for you? I uh, went to Asia um, on the behest of a friend who was studying Chinese in Taiwan. And then once I got onto that, I realized, oh my gosh, I'm in Taiwan, the Philippines is right across the water, or Korea is right across the bay. The door opens up to just anything. And then you get there and you keep going and going, and every day is you're learning something new. And that was, that was like exploring. It was really very liberating. Could, could you show us some images that sort of capture that um, early sense of time for you? Yeah, so here's a guy. I was going to the source of the Ganges near Gangatori. A holy hobo. He was the holy hobo. He's a sadhu living in a cave. He's got his trident, his little b b brass pot. This is the symbol of Shiva? Sh yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. And he's living there in a cave in the Himalayas. <laughs> so it was almost like This is the real cliche. thing. How did you travel from place to place back then? Uh, basically, buses. Buses, trucks, jeeps. The way I did it was I had a backpack that had nothing in it except rolls of film. And, and at that time, to tell someone that you took a roll of film a day, they would just be shocked because by how much film that was. Really? Oh, yeah. It was like, a roll a day, that's amazing. <laughs> this looks so, like you're up in the Himalayas. This is right? Himalayas, this is Nepal, this is mm -hmm. a bamboo bridge in the middle of nowhere. Did you walk that bridge? Mm hmm. It's a pretty scary There's bridge. Some, um, Pani stones mm -hmm. here. So, so, here's how they make lumber. For anybody who's interested in how things are made, you go to Asia and you hang out and you watch because everything is being made in the street. So, so I'm a minimalist and I think that in part came from Asia where I could see that you don't need very much. Anywhere in the world, no matter where you are and how minimal you are, if you give someone the chance of having a tool, they will take it. And that's what technology gives them. Choices. Choices. Let's take us forward just a little bit yeah, more. Yeah, sure. I see one photograph that you're moving towards here is, is marked. This is the game that they play in Afghanistan Ooh. called Buskaji, which Ooh. means goat ball. <laughs> and the rules of goat ball are very simple. There's a dead goat, which is the ball. <laughs> Sometimes they fill it with sand to make it more harder. And you're on horses. And the idea is you have to pick up the goat from the horse, run it around a pole back here, and then come up front and drop it in a circle. You've got, they have a little special whip with a mouthpiece to let them hold it in their mouth while they're holding their saddle and this goat. That was that was a time travel, and then I, you know, my travels took me through India and um, the Nepal Himalayas. and Himalayas. Um, if there's no, if there's only one lesson that people should get from a trip to India, is that the Sikhs are not Muslim. So my travels basically ended almost in Iran, where I was working basically for the Shah. I made my way basically to Israel, to Jerusalem for Passover, and I had a religious conversion, and I stopped traveling. I graduated. Um, true fans, there were yeah. some, uh, some excerpts from your blog that we've been mm -hmm. posting on Boing Boing about a thousand true fans that right, have right. stirred up lots of comments. What, what, in a nutshell, what's the idea? Um, the idea of true fans, a thousand true fans, is a hypothesis that I don't know if it's true, and I'm collecting information, and it's really on the margin of whether it's something that I can prove. But the thesis is very simple, and it says that in this sort of long tail of producers, there seemed to be one way that you were successful, which was you got a hit. You kind of moved up the hit parade, and you got, if you're an artist, or a musician, or an actor, or painter, you got recognized and you had um, a huge 
base of fans. You were number support. one. You were number one. If you were able to cultivate, find, identify, and work directly with a thousand true fans who would purchase anything you produced and would go whatever you sang and would read whatever you wrote and pay maybe between fifty and a hundred dollars a year for you, that you would only need a thousand of them if they were paying you directly to support yourself. Rather than try and make it big, you don't need to make it big, you just need to make it strong and deep. Maybe the model is not just brutal, you the creator and a thousand true fans, that there is maybe another intermediary, more of a direct line than going through a larger institution.